Awesome. Um, so our we're just going to do a sort of special topics lecture. Um, there is not really a a chapter that you could do in one lecture that we had left in our in our textbook. So I went to another textbook I've used before, which has a chapter on drug discovery um, and what how the modern process works. Um, so and so we're going to start here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about history of drug discovery and sort of how things have been done traditionally. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the, the current biochem-based model for how pharmace pharmaceuticals work, um, which has to do mo mostly with enzyme binding affinity. Um, and then we'll talk about the process that they're using now called rational drug discovery, which sort of takes into account computational chemistry and um, statistics. Uh, so it's it's a field um, of uh, bioinformatics is sort of the, the overall field is when you're applying statistics and computational methods to biological systems. Um, that's a, a field that's been been uh, blowing up in recent years um, referred that we usually refer to as bioinformatics or biostatistics. Um, and so it's a, it's a very big field right now. There's also they're also doing a lot of stuff in bioinformatics that has to do in, with environmental science as well, um, because there's, you know, the environment is a very 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 large system, which means it lends itself well to statistical analysis. Um, so a lot of analysis, a lot of genetic analysis fits into biostatistics. You're looking at, um, you know, what are the common sequences before before similar genes in different species, and analyzing those and how the different promoter regions um, affect their their expression in the cells, um, stuff like that. It all fits into that realm of bioinformatics. So like I said, it's a, it's a huge huge field these days, <clears throat> because we can sequence things really, really quickly. We can sequence genomes, um, and we generally don't even have to think about that anymore, because it, to sequence a genome, it's, it's almost an entirely automated process. Um, but then taking it and doing something with that genome or making connections from that genome, uh, takes a lot more thought. And so that's where bioinformatics comes in. You have so much raw data, you need a better way to analyze it than just looking at the A's, C's, T's, and G's. All right, so let's, so as far as how this will show up on the test, <clears throat> we're gonna, it'll, I mentioned before that it's gonna be at most the wild card section. So five points out of, on the test. Um, and I haven't entirely decided how I'm going to ask a question about this, but um, it'll be sort of conceptual and con and uh, vocabulary based. Um, maybe ask you to explain something or give you a hypothetical situation and have you explain what's happening in terms of some of these concepts that we're going to talk about today. Um, probably nothing computation based since we haven't been doing any calculations um, in, in OCHEM really for a long time anyway. So um, give me one second before we get started here. Oh yeah, Elkie. Oh, I was just gonna ask when um, you're doing a practice or like a practice exam, right? For the final oh, um, or no. Yes. We will have a practice exam of some sort. It might just be a study guide or might, might be a full on practice exam. The structure of the exam will be very similar to the midterm. Um, so um, I will get that out probably later today to give okay. you guys time to work on it before the um, before the review on Thursday. Okay. Okay. All right. Give me one second, and then we'll get started here.
All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, so we'll start with the definition of, of a drug. Um, and this is the, the biological definition of a drug is any absorbed substance that changes or enhances the physical or psychological function in the body. Um, and that it also generally, at least legally into in today's world, um, a drug or medication is generally something that um, that your body does not normally have in it. So if you're taking, say, a, a hormone supplement that increases a level of a certain hormone in your body, um, that would not be considered a drug necessarily because it's a, it's a compound that's already naturally in your body and you're supplementing. So generally we'd refer to that as a supplement. So melatonin um, is naturally produced by your body. So if you're taking melatonin to help you sleep at night, that's, that's generally considered a supplement, not a drug. However, if you take a, a substance that increases melatonin's function in your body, but is, it is a foreign substance. It's something that your body doesn't normally make that as a drug, right? So it's the subtle distinction is it's not something, and it's generally it's not something that your body needs to have. So it, to, it's drugs are distinct from vitamins because vitamins are something that your body needs to function um, that it can't make on its own. So, so there's a very subtle difference between a vitamin and a drug because vitamin is, some, is an organic molecule that your body needs that enhances or changes certain physical or psychological functions in the body, just like this definition, um, but it's, it's necessary for life. Um, as, and it, it has its own distinct function and, and sources in the diet, in your diet, which is generally different than a drug. But it is a fairly subtle difference between a vitamin, a supplement, and a drug. They're, they're kind of closely tied together. Um, <clears throat> and the, generally speaking, if we're talking um, about, about um, prescription pharmaceuticals or things that are sold over the counter, um, there's going to be a proprietary name, and there's also a generic name. And so I think Given, given today's society, most of you probably know the difference between proprietary and a generic name. Um, but just for example, you know, amoxicillin would be a generic name for an antibiotic. Trimox was the proprietary name it was originally marketed with. Um, so Premarin is a conjugated estrogen for hormone replacement therapy. Um, Conjugated estrogen would be the generic name. Premarin would be the trade name. So Adderall versus amphetamines um, would be an example as well. Uh, Prozac is a proprietary name. Um, so there's, there's lots of different proprietary versus um, generic names. And generally generic names are going to be the chemical name as opposed to something that they market it with. And anything you see with a trademark symbol or a copyright symbol is going to be going to be the proprietary name. And those names, the trademark is held up a lot longer than the than the copyright on on um, or the patent on the medication itself. So generally, the way legally the way that that drugs are sold in the U.S. Um, is that when a when the FDA approves a new drug for a company, that company has the exclusive rights to produce that drug for seven years. Um, depending on the exact situation, sometimes that's shorter. Um, but then, but that means that nobody else, they basically have a copyright on the molecular structure. So in order to get it approved, they have to disclose the molecular structure and they don't have to disclose how they make it, but they have to they have to show the molecular structure itself to the FDA, as long along with all of the studies that show that it's not dangerous to to the users and what its function is. Um, and then 
their reward is that they get seven years of of a monopoly on that drug. Um, they still, at least with that molecule, if they're entering a field that is already crowded, like say pain management, um, then they're already going to have to compete with the other molecules that are already out there with the opioids and with the over-the-counter pain medication. Um, but they nobody else can use their molecule for seven years. And then after seven years, and sometimes it's three years, I believe, depending, I don't know exactly what the criteria is. Um, after three years that or seven years, then other companies are allowed to jump in there and make it um, their version of it. They make their the same molecule, um, but they don't um, they can charge whatever they want for it. And they they just can't use the proprietary name. Um, so, and by that point, ideally, what the original company has done is had is had, they have such a stranglehold on the market um, for that particular drug that they've made their money back from their from their research and from all of the the process um, of getting it approved, which. For most new drugs, the pro the approval process will and the research the R and D process will cost them, you know, in the billion dollar range. Um, so we're talking pretty big money, and they're starting in the hole with a lot of these. Um, it's not unless you really get a home run on something that everybody needs to buy that you know you're going to be able to sell worldwide. Um, it's almost always a losing endeavor to. To put out a uh, a new um, a new drug, and so generally pharmaceutical companies make their money doing other things as well, and then they they keep keep themselves afloat, and they you know essentially buy their way through the FDA sometimes cheaper than actually doing the studies, um, which is one of the reasons why the opioid crisis wound up the way it did, um, is because the FDA uh, it's it's a process it's that is pretty familiar in science um, where regulatory industries um, wind up being run by people who are advocates for the industry they're supposed to regulate. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's referred to as industry capture. When you get the right lobbyist who gets appointed to be the head of the FDA, all of a sudden the FDA is not regulating drugs so much as rubber stamping them. Um, because he's really at he or she's really advocating for the industry, not regulating the industry. Um, it's also one of the of the problems with the whole approach of uh, treating government like a business. Um, but without getting too much into politics, I'll just leave that there. Um, you don't want your governmental agencies to be run like a business. You want them to be opposing businesses in most cases. Uh, at least from a scientific point of view, their job is very, very different. Their entire outlook is very, very different. Their job is to regulate the businesses, not to be help the businesses make money. Businesses do that well enough on their own. All right. So the way that the, the drug discovery process works before you can get to the point where you're asking the FDA to approve something <clears throat> um, and so this is a process, um, so biochemists, medicinal chemists, pharmaceutical chemists are all the, will all be working on this from different points of view. Um, but medicinal chemist is sort of the generic term for anybody who works um, in chemistry, finding new pharmaceuticals and new drugs is generally referred to as a medicinal chemist or working on finding ways to produce stuff cheaper, finding new synthesis pathways for existing drugs. There's a lot of sort of ties to other chemical areas. So an organic synthesis, um, a chemist who works in organic synthesis might also be working with medicinal chemists um, in some respect or be considered a published in medicinal chemistry journals depending on what their exact work is. Um, so there is a lot of overlap with that. <clears throat> Um, but in general, the goal is we want to find compounds that have strong effects on specific diseases or symptoms with minimal side effects, which seems like a nice goal, right? That's always ideal. Um, 
especially considering a lot of times those minimal side effects are what people actually tend to abuse. If it's a drug that winds up that has a potential for abuse, the side effects are what people actually abuse it for. Um, but there's that um, there's that Arrested Development episode where where uh, Lindsay Funke goes back to taking drugs that suppress her sex drive, right? Because she's married to Tobias, she was taking it for the side effects. Um, that's a that's a comedic example, but that's also true of, of opiates and um, of stimulants and lots of other classes of drugs as well. The side effects are what are what people abuse it for. So if you can find a better compound that's just as potent with fewer side effects, that's generally from the from the point of view of the um, pharmaceutical industry and doctors, that's generally what you're looking for minimize the side effects, but still keep the potent effects for whatever, whatever symptom you're trying to treat. Um, and yeah, so think, these, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to throw in a little tidbit. I think that's how uh, ketamine was discovered is that they really liked fincyclidine as an anesthetic, but the delirium was like a de undesirable side effect. So they kind of made different analogs that were slightly different that had less side effects but still worked as a good anesthetic that's yeah that's exactly right and there's there's um pretty most drugs that are taken um recreationally have a history of being lead compounds uh and so lead compound just means that it's any naturally occurring drug or anything that you already know what it does, but it has some undesirable side effect. So if there's an undesirable side effect, whatever that might be, or maybe it's just not strong enough, and maybe, um, then you can start from that molecular structure um, as, and use that as the lead compound is basically where you start. And then you take that molecular structure and you start tweaking it. And that's what makes what are called analogs. And the analogs of the lead compound are basically where you take, where you keep parts of the lead compounds, molecular structure that you think are important, and then you change other things. Maybe replace a methyl group with an ethyl group. Maybe replace an OH with a chlorine. Maybe replace a six-sided ring with a seven-sided ring. Um, so there are lots of different changes that you can make, and but it's it's very combinatorial in terms of there's there's a list of common substitutions that they can do and in some in some respects there's a you can kind of ahead of time know what that's going to do um so for instance um if you started from an um amphetamine Um, amphetamine is part of a class of molecules called phenethylamines because you have a, a um, benzene ring, so hence phen, and then ethyl because there's two carbons and then amine. Um, you can make certain substitutions on this molecule, and it's, it's this molecule interacts very, very strongly with adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin in the body with those receptor sites and affects all of those concentrations. Um, <clears throat> The most common, at least the most common by as far as how, how it's used worldwide, the most common substitution that's made um, is if you replace one of these um, hydrogens with a methyl group. And in any of these phenethylamine molecules, putting a methyl group on the nitrogen makes it way more strongly interacting um, with uh, adrenaline and dopamine receptors. Um, and so that takes it from being amphetamine, which is a strong drug to be sure, but not nearly as strong as methamphetamine, which we just made by drawing, adding that methyl group. When you add a meth to something, you add a methyl group to the amine that changes the, bind, the way it interacts with these different systems. And in general, for this class of molecules, any phenethylamine that you add a methyl to is going to make it way more, way stronger um, of a drug, way more potent of a drug. 
um, when it comes to interacting with those systems. On the flip side, if instead of doing that, if you put a ketone right there, that actually makes it not as potent. That lessens the strength of the drug. Um, and so you can kind of fine tune it by putting, putting a ketone here, putting an OH group there, putting a methyl group over here, and sort of control which systems it's interacting with and how strongly by doing that. I believe that this is a base molecule. Um, this is close to the molecule that they find in cot, um, which is a, a strong stimulant, but it's not strong as amphetamine. Um, it's uh, commonly chewed in the, as a root, cot root in the uh, Middle East is chewed as a stimulant that's stronger than caffeine, but not as strong as, as cocaine or amphetamine. Um, Cody. I think I remember reading somewhere when I was researching phenethylamines that it was uh, originally isolated from ephedra or ephedrine is where the amphetamines came from. And the cot was the jumping point for the synthetic cathinones like bath salts and stuff, which is where the cath and cathinone comes from is the name cot. And I was just trying to look up the structure for um, ephedrine to see if it's similar to um, amphetamine, but I was too slow. <laughs> uh, so ephedrine is, um, no, sorry, I almost, I almost misspoke. Epinephrine is the, is the American name for adrenaline. In, in medicinal circles, they refer to epinephrine um, in America, but it's adrenaline is, is the common name for that same molecule, They're the same molecule. Ephedrine's a little bit different, um, but yes, you're, you're right. Cot is the, um, was the lead compound that led to a lot of those bath salts um, that they refer to as, as substituted cathinones. Uh, yeah, I just pulled up uh, ephedrine. I could show you the structure if you want to take a look, or you already got it there. So this That's is the structure of the, so it's not a phenethylamine, it's a phenpropylamine um, for, oh, that's for. Um, different than, oh, that's the cathinone. Oh, I got you. Yeah. And so what does the ephedrine look like? Let me turn on the screen share. Go for it. It looks pretty similar, except it's got a, um, my, oh, my it won't, yeah. stop sharing first. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I'll just do that got the OH there but pretty similar it's got instead of having a um a ketone it's got a uh an OH group which is going to be similar to have putting an oxygen on that second carbon whether it's a ketone or an OH it's going to have a similar effect slightly different um as far as how much it's it um changes the binding affinities and things like that um but these are all good examples of these analogs um, where you start from a certain compound um, from the lead compound and then make adjustments to it to make these analogs. So an analog is just anything that is at, shares, shares similar properties with the lead compound, but has certain substitutions or adjustments to, made to it. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times you do wind up with these lead compounds being naturally occurring. Um, so they can, they serve as a prototype. Um, and, but the fact that they're naturally occurring means that you, that a lot of times chemists look for them, um, in traditional medicine. Um, chemists are not shy about where they get their ideas for a lot of this stuff. So they're not, they're not ignoring traditional medicine or, um, you know, ancient, ancient, uh, homeopathic remedies or things like that. If it works, chemists will use it. Um, and so that's a process where you go through a culture's natural or um, a culture's um, traditional or historical medicine and look for new lead compounds is a process called ethnobotany. And ethnobotany is basically because 
every culture historically throughout the world has had certain herbs or certain um, plants or certain certain animals in some cases that are used for medicinal purposes. Um, and so going back through that culture's history and looking and trying to find lead compounds um, is referred to as ethnobotany. And so that's, you get a lot of, a lot of things from, um, we don't consider them to be traditional medicine nearly as much anymore, but from, from um, Europe and from North America, from Native American tribes um, have, have all been sort of um, the word that comes to mind is plundered, but it's not like they're taking anything away from those cultural groups. So maybe that's the wrong word, but they've gone through and sort of tested everything that they can think of that's in all of these traditional medicines, especially from, from cultures that have been more well known to Western society um, and modern medicine for a long time. So, um, and they go through and looked at most of those. Uh, and the, the number one example that comes to mind for Native Americans is salicylic acid, um, which is as mild pain, um, mild headache relieving properties. Um, that they use that as a as a lead compound to make acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. And salicylic acid was is found naturally in willow bark, and so they it was found through this process of ethnobotany. They um, scientists went through willow bark tea and they sort of isolated all the compounds they didn't know what they do and sort of that might be responsible for this use as a traditional remedy and they found salicylic acid and found they did in fact have some mild headache relieving properties they just then made it more potent by adding the the acetyl group to it and making aspirin <clears throat> um and then you see lots of examples from, um, from uh, Eastern Asia. There's lots of examples um, for the one, again, the one that comes to mind is opium. Um, opium was, was used as a lead compound and morphine was used as a lead compound that then led to things like heroin and fentanyl and codeine. And we, we'll talk about all those examples in more detail in a second so we can see those, those structures. But again, it started from a naturally occurring drug that was commonly used in Chinese medicine and progressed into um, finding all these new analogs. Um, another good example from South America is cocaine. Cocaine is a lead, a lead compound um, that had very, very desirable effects in terms of, um, I just saw your comment. Uh, Elke, I do not know whether that was something they knew about at the time or not, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about unexpected side effects as well. Um, and so that, but that would definitely fit into that. I believe that they were mostly looking at headache cures because this is, this was pretty early on in uh, modern medicine that they discovered aspirin. So I don't think they were as worried about acne at that point. I think that was something that was discovered later on. Um, when they, as, as sort of a side effect of um, salicylic acid. Um, so in general, this is an example where the, the desired effect was being a local anesthetic. Um, so we're talking about from the medicinal point of view, not the recreational point of view. Um, and so they were trying to, they, discovered pretty early on again that you could make a paste from coca leaves and apply that to your gums and and your gums would absorb a lot of the compounds in the coca leaves and then that that made dentistry in the late 1800s a lot more palatable um, if you could you know numb your mouth um, and so they were trying to use it as a local anesthetic but has, it also had a lot of other effects, right? In addition to deadening pain where it was applied, it also had a tendency to become very addictive um, and because it affected the central nervous system, the CNS. Um, and so what they did was they just went through and they gradually removed pieces from the cocaine molecule until they get got to an improved lead compound that was still a local anesthetic, but did not affect affect the central nervous system. So that, therefore it's not gonna be 
uh, abused as a recreational drug and it's not going to um, not going to be addictive. Um, and so then they took that and applied it. And what they found was that it was mostly this, this was the most important part of the structure. Um, having a nitrogen a few carbons away from that ester wind up being important too. So most of these other um, anesthet modern anesthetics wind up using that as well. Um, but benzocaine was one of the first, they referred to it as the second generation local anesthetic. Um, and so benzocaine, novocaine, xylocaine, um, anything that's named with that cane um, suffix, generally that means it was a, it's an analog of cocaine. Um, and as you can imagine, that made dentistry and getting your teeth worked on a whole lot more pleasant um, when you could you know, not have to feel them pulling your teeth out. Um, if we replace, then they started looking at things like, okay, well, what if we started from procaine? So once you get to some new, some new molecules, you, they can say, okay, well, out of these, procaine is the one that works the best. Um, and sometimes it's also, um, it's the, the compound that your company has the exclusive rights to distribute is where you start from looking for new analogs um, because your company already has a history of working with that particular compound and already has data for that compound that may or may not have been made public um, when you got your drug approved by the FDA. Um, but then you can take procaine and now use that as a lead compound. So it's sort of an ongoing process. Started with cocaine as your lead compound, and then you made this, this new lead compound that had some similar properties, but not all of them. And then you took that and you modified that to get these three. And then out of those, if procaine showed the most promise, you take procaine and you start making tweaks to that. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing chain reaction where as soon as you get to a new drug, you then turn around and use that as your lead compound in a lot of, a lot of cases. Um, so in this case, if they took, they took procaine and they switched the ester to an amide, uh, and they found that it still works as a local anesthetic, but it also has these other properties where it slows down your heart which is very different than where we started, right? We started two, two generations ago with cocaine, which does not slow down your heart. And now by, we've gone through a few iterations and now we've got this compound that still works as a local anesthetic, but in addition to being a local anesthetic, it also will work to keep your heartbeat regular and slow, which is very use, useful in terms of surgery. Um, if you have, if you're giving somebody an anesthetic for surgery, you want them to keep their heart rate down. You don't want them to be panicked the whole time. Um, and so this is just an example of sometimes you wind up with very different re, um, side effects than what you started. And sometimes the side effect winds up becoming the primary um, effect that you're looking at. So this one is not traditionally used as a local anesthetic anymore. Procaine and benzocaine and lidocaine are actually better as a local anesthetic than, than procainamide, um, but it is used as an anti-arrhythmatic, meaning to keep your, it's going to keep your um, heartbeat from being irregular or from, from elevating. Um, Historically, morphine also has similar history that I mentioned before. Um, morphine occurs naturally in, in um, opium. It's one of the primary compounds responsible for opium's effects. Um, it's named after, morphine is named after the, it's Greek or Roman, 
god of uh, dreams, Morpheus. Um, leave it's like that and the based on the name i think that that's roman the roman name but i'm not sure i don't know i can't keep the roman and greek gods straight anymore it's been a long time um but basically after, named after after a god of sleep and dreams um because it basically you know, knocked you out um and then but then even even back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they knew how dangerous opium was and the people got addicted to it and it had long-term health effects. And so they used that as a, um, as a lead compound and started making adjustments to it. And so that's how you wind up with, with codeine and heroin and fentanyl are all analogs of morphine. All of the opiates, are going to share this common structure and you can tell just by looking at these structures they're very close um, to the same molecule and for all of these the only things that are really uh, the only that are really changed are these substitutions at the bottom the rest of the molecule is identical Partly that's because we don't fully understand the entire mechanism by which these work. Um, we understand it a lot better than they did in the early 1900s. Um, and, but you can, it's, the receptor sites that these drugs work on are very complex and require this, most of this structure to be pretty similar. Um, <clears throat> especially having the three, the four fused rings with the, five fused rings, including the oxygen in the middle. And if you don't have all of that, then you're not going to hit the, the get the general anesthetic qualities that they're usually looking for with opiates, um, meaning deadens pain across the entire body as opposed to um, a local anesthetic, which is just deadening pain in one part of the body. Hmm. Um, and you may or may not be a little surprised to see codeine in there because we don't usually think of codeine as being a painkiller. Um, despite how close the structure is, is Greek. Thank you, Adam. Um, despite how close the structure is between codeine and morphine, codeine's predominant effect, it works as a painkiller, but not nearly as well as it works as an antitussive. Um, and an antitussive means it gets used as a, it, it suppresses the cough reflex. Tussive or tussative? There might be an extra syllable in there. Yeah, antitussive. Um, and actually knowing that as the root actually makes a lot of names of cough syrups make more sense. Robitussin, um, that uh, T-U-S-S -S, um, root is has to do with the, um, goes back to T-O-S um, as the root, which has, means having to do with coughing. So an antitussive suppresses the cough reflex. Um, so most of the opioids in general are going to have very, very strong pain relieving effects, among other things. They suppress the, the central nerve, the unconscious nervous system. They make your breathing more shallow, cause nausea. Um, they you know, can, can render you unconscious. But for whatever reason, codeine, despite having very similar structure to morphine, also suppresses your cough reflex, which I guess is kind of related, right, to that's part of the unconscious nervous system. So it kind of makes sense that you're, it's just suppressing the cough reflex portion more than some of the other um, unconscious nervous system. <clears throat> um, 
but all of a sudden, once you realize that codeine can used as, be used as a cough suppressant, that now you can, you've got codeine you can use as a new lead compound. So it, the, the generations, the lineage of most modern cough medications, morphine to codeine, codeine to a variety of others, Um, such as dextro, dextromethorphan, um, etorphine, and pen, pentazosine. I believe etorphine is, winds up going back to being a um, central nervous system depressant and effective and painkiller. Um, I believe it's used also as an elephant uh, tranquilizer because it's, pot it's one of those that's, that's even more potent by um, by gram than fentanyl, um, if I'm remembering which one this is right properly. It's, um, it is a synthetic opioid possessing approximately 1,000 to 3,000 times stronger than morphine um, by mass. So yes, yeah, so I believe that that's the one that's that's used as an elephant tranquilizer because you that allows you to to give an elephant a a shot the size of what you would give a human and knock it unconscious. Um, so very very dangerous. They were not expecting that necessarily when they started from codeine, which ha does not have those those effects nearly as strong. Um, but they did from codeine wind up with dextromethorphan. Um, which is the most common ingredient in, in Robitussin uh, and pretty much any cough syrup um, that you can buy over the counter is going to have, have dextrom dextromethorphan in it. Um, and you can see it's, it's missing a few of those really strong features. It doesn't have the oxygen ring structure right here. It doesn't have the other substitution over here. So they've, they've altered it pretty significantly, which is why dexamethorphine does not get um, abused to the same level that morphine or, or um, heroin or fentanyl does. Um, it is, it can still be abused as an opiate, but at, at concentrations way higher than, than what you see um, for most, um, most opioids. And really with, with a lot different effects. It's still used recreationally to some extent, um, but with very, very different effects. Um, and it actually winds up turning into it, the way that it changes, that changing that structure changes which enzyme processes it interacts with, turns dextromethorphan from being an opioid. It's still technically an opioid, but it actually acts more like a disassociative hallucinogen. Um, or also sometimes referred to as a deliriant as well, where it basically messes with how well your senses interact with the world around you. <clears throat> um, and, and you can basically wind up with your brain functioning more or less normally, with, but with no way to communicate with your senses. Um, so I've, I've heard it described, dissociatives like dextromethorphan or ketamine described as being um, a brain in a jar. You have no ability to act with the outside world, but your brain is still thinking more or less properly. Um, so very different than morphine and heroin and fentanyl, which are going to have very, very specific um, interactions with, um, with the, your brain's thought process. All right, so the... The practical upshot for, of all those sort of case studies, all those historical examples, um, is this idea that drug discovery starting from a lead compound is not a linear process necessarily. It does, it's not a simple process where everything is predictable because sometimes these side effects that were perhaps uh, in the original lead compound were, were unintended or um, undesirable wind up being the primary effect if you switch your frame of view. From, from the point of view of a painkiller, codeine is not as good 
as morphine or heroin. But from the point of view of, of an antitussive, codeine is way better than the others, right? So switching their frame of reference and sort of going down the rabbit hole a little bit in terms of changing what, what you're looking for um, is not always what your bosses, if you're working in a pharmaceutical company, that's not always what your bosses want. Um, necessarily, but it doesn't mean that you didn't, you discovered a molecule that's worthless. It just means that it's not as desirable for what you're looking for. Um, and so those are those numerous unexpected side effects. Numerous unexpected side effects can become the primary effect if you change your frame of reference. If it's good enough, if one of those side effects is strong enough and desirable in other instances, you can wind up with that being um the primary effect and kind of starting from that as your new lead compound and every time you do that you get a new generation of synthetic drugs or or at least they may may or may not be synthetic um but you are sort of your it's sort of directing your your attention down these other possible corridors of of drug discovery um, if you take one of those side effects and decide to use that as your as your desired side effect, um, the dextromethorphan, I should also say, don't go out and buy Robitussin and and drink a whole bunch of it without doing any research on that, because uh, there are a lot of other compounds added to Robitussin to prevent you from doing that, from using it recreationally. Um, that can make you and put you in a lot of pain or make you very, very sick. Um, so please do not go do that. But that is, they use that same compound from Mucinex, um, guanificin, um, and they add that to most Robitussin. And if you take too much of the guanificin, it just makes you vomit um, like you would not believe. It's a, I can't remember what the name is for the, for compounds that cause um, vomiting as a, as a medicinal pharmaceutical effect, but it is one of those. It's like Ipecac. Um, um, and then, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, so these drugs may or may not be synthetic, and sometimes the side effects wind up being, once you change your point of view, the side effects wind up being exactly what you um, are looking for. And that's, that's why there's been certain sort of booms in certain recreational um recreational drugs because for the for most of medicinal chemistry's history um they've been trying to avoid things like hallucinations and avoid things like stimulant effects that um could be used recreationally and so if you get a bunch of chemists together that decide no we're going to use being a good a fun stimulant as being our desirable effect and use those as lead compounds you wind up with a whole classes of synthetic drugs that are very, very poorly understood um, based on, on things like, um, you know, cothinone. And so that's how you get things like bath salts that, yeah, they're very, very good at being a recreational stimulant if you're into that sort of thing, but they're also um, very, very addictive and you might wind up staying up for four days in a row and trying to eat your dog's face. Um, and bath salts are famous for those sort of stories. And I think generally it's because there's other psychosis happening under the, behind the pictures, but it's also hard to know because the, um, a lot of these synthetic drugs that are used recreationally are um, what they call designer drugs are very, very poorly understood. They're not studied beyond, is this fun and will people buy this? Um, they don't go through an FDA regulatory process, but they're basic, they're essentially using the same process we're talking about here, except aiming it towards recreational effects. And lots are all are misrepresented as molly too. There's a lot of drugs in this cat in a lot of these categories that are both stimulants and mild hallucinogens or um, empathogens, they call them. Um, and pathogens enhance your feeling of empathy for the people around you. So MDMA is a classic example of that. It makes you feel warm and fuzzy towards the, your, the people that you're with um, and other people in general. 
And so there's a lot of these other other designer drugs that have similar effects to Molly. They're, and so they're, and because everybody knows what Molly is and there's a lot of demand for it, a lot of the times it gets sold as Molly. It's this very similar to fentanyl being passed off it as heroin or, um, or a lot of um, different amphetamines get passed off as being actual amphetamine or or other other stimulants as well. So there's a lot of that because it's not regulated. So definitely, as I've said before, don't buy street drugs, kids, um, because you don't know exactly what you're getting. All right, let's take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 9.05 and we'll talk a little bit more about the process of how they do it now that's beyond just simple guess and check. Cool topic choice for today's lecture, man. I'm glad you like it. It's uh, it's one that I kind of had, I have done similar stuff in the past that kind of fit in with some of, I think with everybody's um, interests since most of you are going more towards the health and biology side of things compared to, I thought about doing polymers and plastics, but um, that one would have required a whole lot more work on my end and can't really do it in one lecture. So this one lent itself well, so. But I got to step away for a second as well. Cool. I'll be back in a sec.
All right. Uh, and I also would like to reassure all of you that um, I did see your messages on uh, your time slots um, for the uh, presentation. And um, with that in mind, I will put those in here in a few minutes. Um, so you, so that everybody's showing up in the table at the top. Um, I don't think that there were any uh, any conflicts there where you where two people requested the same one. You that nice thing about you being able to see everybody else's responses means you all know what everybody else already signed up for. Um, so I'll put those all in and we'll be good to go later today. Um, and as I mentioned, I will also get you your practice test or study guide um, out in a little bit. Um, so you will have some um, some uh, time before Thursday's um, review session to double check your understanding. Um, and we should be, and you should be good to go there. All right, so the way we take these approaches um, in modern, modern um, technology and modern processes is that now we've gotten to the point where we can actually screen so many potential drugs so quickly, um, mostly by using, by using um, combinatorial methods where you basically just mix and match different pieces that are known to have some effects on the human body. Um, and you can basically just screen through those all digitally and and wind up doing calculations that show, okay, this compound should have this sort of binding affinity to and affect this system, the serotonin system, for instance. And it should also interact with the, this acetylcholine system, but not react with the noradrenaline system or the adrenaline system. Um, and so you can you can basically fine tune what you expect most of the effects will be um, almost totally digitally. And so they refer to that as in silica trials. So you've got so in vivo trials means in living organisms. So in vivo is Latin for living, right? Um, in vitro means in petri dishes, testing in, in labs, usually with bacteria um, or just synthesizing them and seeing how testing binding affinity directly by putting them with certain enzymes, but not in a living organism necessarily. Um, and then computers and computational chemistry has added another category here that they call in silica. In silica trials, means that you're purely computational at this point. Um, and so that's using some of the ab initio methods that we used earlier in this quarter, or um, there are also methods that, that calculate a lot faster and can handle a lot larger molecules, um, where you basically can measure what their binding affinities are, are likely to be for the, a specific molecule based on what pieces you put together. Um, and so it's, those in silica trials wind up being really, really critical. And they basically give you a new lead compound. So you do in silica trials to find a new lead compound, and then you actually make the lead compound and you test it. These days, we generally, in, in pharmaceutical chemistry, in research, you skip the in vitro stage because there's not a whole lot that you can test um, in a Petri dish that you, um, if we're talking about, you know, um, a lot of, um, these systems that are um, that are only present in multicellular organisms, right? A E. coli does not have opioid receptors. Um, so, with that in mind, a lot of times the in vitro stage is kind of is kind of um, ignored. The exception being things like vaccines and antibiotics. So for an antibiotic, you might have an in vitro stage where you use an in, in silica trial to find a new potential antibiotic. 
and then you try exposing a petri dish full of e coli or whatever whatever you're trying to test uh, target um, <clears throat> in a petri dish you test it and see if it actually does kill the bacteria and then you try it in something like a rat um, to see if it fights the infection without killing the animal and so you do still have all three of those stages for antibiotics and vaccines. Um, but when it comes to a lot of pharmaceuticals, um, we don't, we kind of skip the in vitro stage if we're not trying to, if we're not dealing with any um, bacteria or any infections of that nature. Um, if it's a true random screen, then then you basically do it without you try to put out of your mind that you already know some compounds that affect certain systems you're basically starting from scratch with no lead compound in mind and just randomly going through to see what might fit um, certain receptor sites in different enzymes um and and as it mentions on here in antibiotics random screening is done in vitro because then you're just looking at what bacteria are affected without having to deal with what other systems in a, in a larger animal are affected. So you, you wind up with a lot of things that are powerful antibiotics that way, but, but might have unacceptable side effects in that case, because, um, because generally speaking, if you talk to a chemist, they can find a way to kill bacteria. It just might also kill anything else it touches. Um, I got, somebody was giving me a hard time at the, at the school the other day because, not the other day, it was last year, um, last summer when we had all those wasps around, um, all those uh, yellow jackets, and uh, we had a bunch of them right by my house that were resistant to the, to the yellow jacket spray. Um, I dumped a whole can of yellow jacket spray down their nest and, and they just walked right through it and didn't, weren't affected in the slightest. Um, and so somebody, somebody at the college said something like, well, you're a chemist. Why don't, you know, you can't figure out some way to kill them. Well, yeah, I could. I just might kill half the wildlife in the meadow. Um, right. So that's, that's what the approach is with these antibiotics. Like, yeah, we can kill bacteria. We just need to do it without also killing the host. Um, but you do generally still start from an in vitro trial in that case, because that, that at least, then if you find something that doesn't even affect the bacteria, there's no need to continue down that particular pathway. Um, however, in vitro doesn't always work, even for antibiotics, it's in the case of prodrugs. And prodrugs are really interesting. Um, prodrugs are compounds that are not active in the method that you take them. So, but when your body processes them, it turns them into a drug that is active. So it's, it's a pro-drug because it's before the actual drug. A pre-drug might even be a better description, but maybe that term was already taken. Um, so because your body always goes through certain pathways to break down foreign molecules, if you can, you can use those to undergo the last step or increase the lifespan of a drug in your in your body um, if if the active form of the drug is actually what's made by your body itself. So for instance, this in this Prontosil, um, the active form of the drug, which <clears throat> and I believe this is an antibiotic, if I'm remembering correctly, um, this is the active form of the drug. But when you, you get that, because your body naturally, when it comes across a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond, the first thing your body does is it breaks that nitrogen-nitrogen double bond and turns it into an amine. It adds an acetyl group to, the, to one of the nitrogens, probably both of the nitrogens, realistically. And then that turns it into paraacetaamidobenzene sulfonamide. And so you're actually making use of the fact that your body will do this for you. Um, and that, that has a numerous beneficial effects from the med from medicinal chemistry standpoint. 
um, because some compounds, you know, this paraacetamido, ben, paraacetamido benzene sulfonamide, if you expose this to stomach acid, say, in this form as the form of the amide, well, amides can be turned back to being um, carboxylic acids, right? You could wind up breaking this off if you expose it to a strong acid and turning it back into being an amine and acetic acid. So there are some drugs that you can't take orally because of the way the digestive system works, but you can take the prodrug orally. And then let your body, once it's absorbed, your body will take it and naturally convert it to the active form. So this, and this can also have a lot of beneficial effects when it comes to um, slowing down the drug delivery. If you take a drug orally, then as soon as it's absorbed through your digestive system, it hits your bloodstream at full strength. And so there tends to be, if you look at the concentration of a certain drug um, versus time, for the most part, the most independent of what's called the ROA, which stands for route of administration, Um, the, the ROA can be anything from taking it orally to inhaling something to injections to smoking something. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can go about administering these drugs. Uh, and generally, regardless of what the ROA is, the total effect of the drug over time is going to be pretty similar. It kind of looks like a Boltzmann distribution um, where you wind up with, you know, if you take it orally, you wind up with something where you start with the concentration, the concentration of the drug versus time, where it looks, it goes up. Ah, I can do better than that. That's about It's going to go up. And then gradually drop off over time. If that's the oral route, then if you did something like injecting it, it hits the bloodstream a lot faster and you get more intense effects, but it doesn't last as long. And so the these different ROAs in general are going to have different the, the shape of the function is going to be very similar. In the generally speaking, the area under the curve is the same. The, if the concentration of the drug is related to how intense the effects are or other side effects, though changing the route of administration can change this dramatically. And what pro drugs do is they slow this down even more because you're waiting on the enzymes in your body to actually break down the prodrug and turn it into the active form. So it, if it was a prodrug, you might see this, again, the same shape and the same area under the curve. But much, much longer lived. And so with that in mind, that's, that can be very, very beneficial for something like an antibiotic, right? Because with the antibiotic, you don't want all of these peaks and valleys. You don't want it to spike right away and then fall off right away. You want it to be constant through the entire course of the, of the drug, of the antibiotic, so that you're killing the, the bacterial infection the whole way through. So prodrugs are really, really helpful for administering a lot of these other pharmaceuticals because it eliminates those peaks and valleys. Um, of course, the exact enzyme that's responsible for, the, for breaking down the drug, what your initial concentration is, how stable the drug is on its own, the prodrug is on its own. There's a lot of other variables that go into this. This is a really, really helpful tool when it comes to medicinal chemistry and make and trying to to 
finagle the concentration so it's exactly what you want for the same amount of, of time. Or there are some drugs where you do want the peaks and valleys. Um, you know, a lot of pain, pain medications, um, if you're in severe pain right away, getting that initial peak of concentration is going to really, really calm down all of your, your pain systems and your unconscious nervous system that's, that's on high alert because you're in pain and you're stressed out. And then that lower tailed off system is where you actually want it to stay for longer once you get over the initial pain. But for a lot of pain medication, that initial peak is also very, very desirable. That said, that initial peak is also what most people are looking for when they're abusing painkillers recreationally. Um, so it has its downside to that as well, right? They're trying to get back up to that peak. Um, which is generally what they're referring to. And you, if you've ever heard anybody use the term chasing, they're not chasing the drug, they're chasing the peak of that, uh, of that concentration and the effects in the body. Um, and sometimes we just wind up with drug discovery happening almost accidentally. Um, so the very first we talked about, we talked about benzodiazepines a little bit last week. Um, the very first benzodiazepine, Librium, was discovered at completely accidentally. They were doing a reaction where they were trying to make this compound. They were trying to use methylamine as a nucleophile to do a substitution reaction and replace um, a chloromethyl group with, the, with this um, methylamine group at the, at the benzene, or sorry, at the chlorine. They're trying to replace the chlorine with the methylamine group. Um, but what they actually found out happened was that you actually attacked at the, not at the chlorine carbon, but at this aromatic carbon. And it wound up going through this rearrangement reaction where you took this starting compound and turned it into a seven-sided ring. You basically added a carbon and rearrange the ring to turn it from being a six-sided ring to a seven-sided ring, which was totally unexpected. All they were really looking for was an SN2 reaction, and they got something totally different. Um, but the result of that is they made chlordiazepoxide, um, better known as Librium, which was the, the very first benzodiazepine. They used it as a tranquilizer. Um, which I don't even know if we still use the term tranquilizer anymore for, um, as we don't use it for things people take, uh, they, we use the term sedative, if it's something somebody's taking, uh, um, taking on purpose generally. A tranquilizer is not something that's just going to put you to sleep. The whole idea with a tranquilizer, tranquil means calm, right? It calms you down. Um, so this led to that whole class of benzodiazepines as mostly anti-anxiety drugs, but also anti-psychotics as well, where if somebody was having a schizophrenic attack or they were manic and having, and you, um, you know, the staff at a, at a psych ward couldn't get them to calm down, they could give them one of these benzodiazepines and calm everything down. Um, because it, it works to basically undo, it basically, slows down the adrenaline and dopamine systems and bumps up some of these other systems, the acetylcholine and the GABA systems that, that have, uh, that are sort of opposing the dopamine and the, um, dopamine and the adrenaline systems. So you can, can kind of undo a manic state if you have these, um, and so that's what led to, once you started from Librium, now all of a sudden this was totally unexpected, but they're like, well, now we've got a new lead compound. Let's see what we can do with this. Um, and up until 1960, they traditionally would have used things like barbiturates um, for, for a lot of the same purposes, which are much more like a sleeping pill where you can actually, um, but they're far easier to overdose on. Um, than a lot of these benzodiazepines. You can still overdose on a benzodiazepine, but the, the concentration range where it's safe is a lot larger, which means it's a lot harder to overdose on. 
than a lot of opiates or barbiturates. Um, and so here's the class of, of um, benzodiazepines, um, the, the greatest hits, if you will, of this category. And a lot of them you've, you've definitely heard of, Valium and Xanax in particular. Um, and some of these you may not have heard of, or you may have heard of, but not in the context of being in the same category, um, because Rohypnol, I believe, is um, roofies. I believe that that's what's used um, as, a, as a date rape drug, um, if I'm rem remembering correctly. And I know clonopin, clonazepam at the bottom, is, an, is a um, bipolar medication. Um, so less for anxiety and more to keep to keep you from reaching either manic or depressive states um, if you're diagnosed bipolar. Um, oh, made famous by the um, by Silver Lining Playbook. If you remember that movie? There, that um, clonazepam gets uh, gets brought up at one point. Like, oh, I know, right? What day is it? Um, because it basically just mellows you out so much you have no idea what's happening. Um, and then some of these others are not as common. I believe Ativan is still commonly used as anti-anxiety. If you're using it on a regular basis, Ativan is more commonly used than Xanax or Valium um, because it's a little bit less addictive and, and can keep that more steady concentration in the bloodstream as opposed to the peaks and valleys that you get from Xanax or Valium. Um, Xanax is used when you're having an acute panic attack to get you calmed down very quickly. Um, but uh, Ativan, I believe, does not do that nearly as quickly, but it's more used for chronic conditions, <clears throat> similar to clonazepam. But then again, I'm no doctor whatsoever. This is all just hearsay and things I've read on Wikipedia for the most part. Um, so it's been, a, and my biochem class did not cover most of this. So um, I'm just teaching you about things that I've picked up along the way. So take it. If you have more personal experience um, and your personal experience or your doctor tells you things differently than me, then trust them over me. Um, I'm just sort of giving you a primer on some of this stuff. Um, the reason that these wind up getting all similar molecules wind up having similar effects is in general, it has to do with and this is one of the key ideas of biochemistry and modern medicine as a whole. Modern medicine is based around biochemistry um, and this idea of using, well, it's partly using the scientific method along with um, double blind trials, but it's also the idea that pharmaceuticals work by binding to receptor sites on enzymes or on cells. Um, and so with that in mind, that's mainly what we're trying to tweak when we make all of these different analogs all, um, within these starting from a lead compound is we're trying to tweak just how well they bind to certain receptor sites. And different receptor sites are associated with different um, neurotransmitter systems, different unconscious nervous system systems, different um, physiological systems in general. And so, by changing what binding sites it attaches to, we change what and how well it binds, we change what systems in the body are affected. And so a lot of them are, are sort of brought up from the point of view of the brain because the brain kind of controls everything. If you mess with systems in the brain, you can affect the entire body that way. But there are also some that are affected just in specific systems as well that don't affect the brain nearly as much. But in general, what we're looking for is on a specific cell or a specific enzyme, there's a receptor site that can eat, that can be bound to or adjusted or tweaked in a way that, that gives the drug its particular pharmaceutical effect. Um, and so those, those bindings, typically we're not talking about covalent bonds, although that can happen. Typically we're talking about hydrogen bonding. Um, so electrostatic attractions, um, so partial positives and partial negatives, full positives, full negatives, because remember a lot of these molecules that we're dealing with have a charge at physiological pH. So you can have ionic attraction, you can have hydrogen bonding, you can have hydrophobic interactions. 
where you wind up with the nonpolar region of a molecule is attracted to the nonpolar region of a binding site. Um, and so that's that's why aromatic regions wind up playing such a big role in a lot of these pharmaceutical molecules is because a lot of these binding sites have um, a section that it specifically attracts high electrons from benzene rings to sort of slot in between two other benzene rings. And then you get that pi stacking effect. So it's a little bit like you slide the pi, the benzene ring in here, and that aligns your nitrogen lone pair facing this way towards a partial positive. And that aligns this um, chlorine group pointing, which has a partial negative pointing towards another partial positive. Um, and so when you put all of that together, you get can get very strong attractions, a very strong, they refer to them as binding affinity. Um, and that's basically the sum of, of how, so binding affinity is generally thought of as being like an equilibrium constant, where your the reaction is, um, the they refer to it as the substrate, is the molecule that goes, that re, binds to the receptors. So it's substrate plus enzyme, and it's in, in a equilibrium with the enzyme substrate complex. That's the bound form of the substrate. And it's an equilibrium constant. And so binding affinity is usually thought of as being an equilibrium constant. So it's going to look like your binding affinity is equal to the concentration of enzyme substrate complex divided by concentration of enzyme times your concentration of substrate, free enzyme and free substrate. So binding affinity is, is an equilibrium reaction. And then we also will talk about binding energy. And that's the energy for the delta G for this reaction, which we, and we call that, that's going to be the binding energy. And so the good news about this is binding affinity we have we actually have ways of measuring equilibrium constants directly if you remember from gen chem we had experiments where we could directly measure equilibrium constants by starting with a known concentration of of your reactants and then measuring what the concentration was of the product at equilibrium we can measure binding affinity directly and binding energy, we can actually calculate using those ab initio methods or other easier computational methods. And these wind up being related to each other as well, because if you know the binding energy, you can estimate the binding affinity. Because you can always use, if you have an energy for a reaction, you can always use equilibrium constant for that reaction is E to the negative delta G over RT. So if you know delta G, or you can estimate delta G computationally, you can actually predict what the binding affinity is with a really pretty straightforward calculation. And yeah, it's got an exponent in it, but at the same time, like as far as some of these computations go, that's a really easy calculation. Right, so it winds up that these in silica trials play are pretty, pretty useful in a lot of these. Um, and that, that means we can change what those binding affinities are and those binding energies are by changing what analog we have, by changing what the structure is. And this last point, I didn't write this, this sentence, but I left it in there to illustrate a point. You don't always want a really, really good binding affinity. Sometimes a really, really good binding affinity can be a problem because it slows down the natural reaction too much. If you interfere too strongly, then you wind up with drugs that are too potent. 
like that atorphine or like fentanyl, right? You want drugs that work, but we don't want to make the effects permanent, right? Um, generally speaking, you want there to be that, nor that initial spike and then it slowly trails off, or you want it to last for a week and then go away. If it binds too strongly, then things don't work properly. And even, even something natural like hemoglobin, hemoglobin, you don't want hemoglobin to bind too strongly to oxygen because what's hemoglobin's job in the body? Does hemoglobin actually use the oxygen? Just a transporter, right? It's a transporter. Can you imagine? So think about this in the context of a semi truck. Um, if you had a semi truck and you and you took the trailer on the semi truck and you and you super glued the door shut, that's not a very effective transporter anymore, right? You can drive stuff around, but you can't get it. You can't unload it once you get it where you need it. Right, so hemoglobin is a case is a very specific case of you want your binding infinity to be in a very specific zone. Too strong is bad, um, and so that's that's also true of drugs. Too strong of an interaction can be a problem because it starts cascading into other systems that way. If you get too much of a certain molecule of a certain normal biological molecule in your system. So for instance, if you increase dopamine levels too much, um, let's say we're talking about, you know, one of the, um, I have to be careful with psychiatric, um, psychi psychiatric disorders because they're very, very complicated. But one of the simplified ways of thinking of ADHD is that in people with ADHD don't have enough dopamine in their brains at baseline levels. Um, and so they can't focus on things and get a feeling of, of reward for completing small tasks the way that the average person does. And the way to it, that we treat that is by giving them amphetamine, which raises your average dopamine level a little bit. So it's more like the average person. Now, all of a sudden doing a small task like turning a page or putting a dish in the dishwasher gives them a, enough of a tiny boost in dopamine that it registers as a reward and, and reinforces that behavior. Well, if you increase your dopamine levels too much, you start affecting adrenaline levels, which is when you start getting amphetamine being used recreationally, that's what's happening is you're increasing your dopamine levels a ton, and which also affects your adrenaline levels and noradrenaline levels and serotonin levels. And so that's why we don't typically use methamphetamine to treat ADHD because it binds too well to those dopamine receptor sites. We want it to bind well, but not too well. They, and they actually do still prescribe methamphetamine for ADHD um, in the US, but only in very, very extreme cases. If somebody has ADHD to the point where their dopamine levels are through the floor and you need to raise them up to normal levels, they might prescribe small amounts of methamphetamine. But your average age, average ADHD person gets prescribed methamphetamine and they're manic all the time. Um, and you've just created a different problem at that point. Right, so it's not always that we want things to be, um, we want a perfect or a very strong binding affinity between these two. There's a fine line there, especially with psych meds. Anytime you go to to an extreme in psychiatric medication, um, almost always going to an extreme is going to cause a problem. Um, histamine also is a pretty good example um, because, and this is in a different field than, than most um, psych meds, um, histamine is one of the one of the chemical messengers that kind of controls the immune system. And so histamine basically is, it's associated with allergic responses. If you have, if your um, histamine, have too much histamine in any one place or it binds too strongly to a histamine receptor, too much of the histamine receptors are in that histamine receptor complex, then it triggers an, an immune response, which is what we perceive as common cold symptoms. Um, if it's trying to fight a foreign infection or as an allergic response. If it's 
if it's recognizing some antigen as being a foreign invader, um, then it then histamine basically ramps up the immune system in that area. Uh, if you want to calm that down, you have to use an antihistamine. And antihistamines have a similar structure to histamine. Um, and we basic antihistamines work in a meth in a um, mechanism called competitive inhibition. When you take upper division biochem, you'll see you'll spend a whole bunch of time on mechanisms for inhibition because there's a lot of different ways. Competitive inhibition basically is the easiest to understand. Um, basically, instead of letting histamine bond to those receptor sites, you block it by, by filling up those receptor sites with something else. And that prevents the immune response from happening. And so Benadryl, Promine, Talifin, these are all molecules that have similar shapes. And they're actually, they're similar to being phenethylamines, right? You've got two or three carbons in a row with the nitrogen at one end and something aromatic on the other end. So they also interact with some of those other neurotransmitter systems as well. Um, and you'll notice that for pretty much all of them are gonna have a lone pair and some benzene rings about two carbons away from your nitrogen. So histamine's got a nitrogen, two carbons, and then some lone pairs and some ar uh, aromaticity. All of these other antihistamines are similar that way. They're a little bit bigger, so they don't fit too snugly because you don't want an antihistamine that's so strong that you prevent all immune system response because you probably want some immune system response still active in that area. Um, or else you're getting into the region of you're just opening yourself up to infection. So they bind a little bit and slow down the immune response and that can prevent allergies. Um, and they all, they all work in that same mechanism of competitive inhibition, right? They slow things down by just getting in the way. Um, you could think of it maybe like um, if you've got 10 cars, a group of 10 cars that are going on a road trip to San Francisco, the receptor site, you might think of the receptor site as being the, uh, the toll plaza before you get on the Bay Bridge, All right? If it's just your 10 cars, you can get through that just fine. But if you flood it with other cars that are not the 10 cars you care about, all of a sudden your 10 cars can still get through, but at a much slower rate. You just have these other cars taking spaces up. So those receptor sites that the other cars are occupying would be like the different lanes, the different stalls that they have to pay through. Um, and this explains some of the other side effects of um, of antihistamines is antihistamines also typically interfere in a competitive inhibition with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter that controls a lot of the unconscious nervous system. Um, and this peristalsis, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, is, is basically a trembling. It basically, you can wind up with the shakes if you have too much acetylcholine. Um, in fact, a lot of um, nerve gases work on the acetylcholine system because it controls all of your unconscious nervous system in a lot of ways. Um, and it also affects wakefulness and memory. Um, so very, very powerful system. And the, But the binding sites are similar to the binding sites of histamine receptors. And so all of a sudden taking antihistamine is going to mess with your acetylcholine levels as well which means wakefulness memory can be affected as well, which is why most, most allergy medications will knock you out pretty quickly if you get them into high concentrations um, because you're also messing with your acetylcholine levels. Um, and it's also why things like Ambien which work primarily on the acetylcholine system, also mess with your memory, why you can be awake and not remember it. 
why you can have blackouts on Ambien uh, is because yes, Ambien affects your wakefulness and can put you to sleep, but it also can make you make it so you don't remember a thing if you are awake. Um, and so that also mean, leads to you know, Benadryl being used to treat insomnia and motion sickness because it's working on these other systems as well. Right, so in a lot of times you do see that um, in, in the US especially where you wind up with the same drug marketed differently for different purposes. Um, if you look at those like z or whatever those, those over-the-counter sleep aids are, most of them are just Benadryl, but they're marketed as being for helping with sleep, which means they can charge more for it. Nobody pays very much for Benadryl anymore because Benadryl is so ubiquitous, it's everywhere, right? You can find it um, allergy, anti-allergy medication anywhere. But if you turn around and say that this is gonna help you sleep better, people will pay more for it. So check your active ingredients before you go pay for something like Sequel. Um, here's also another case of, of um, a, so four methyl histamine actually got used to deliver anti-ulcer and heartburn drugs as well, um, because it wound up interacting with those systems as well. Histamine is like sort of all over the place as far as the different systems. And a lot of these unconscious nervous systems um, are all linked together. And so a slightly different antihistamine starts interfering with the production of stomach acid while also limiting your allergic response in other ways. So um, just changing, starting from the same lead compound of we want to mess with histamine, but going one direction gives you anti-allergy and sleep aid drugs and the other direction, going the other direction with it and looking for other side effects gives you heartburn drugs. Um, and occasionally you wind up with something that's way different. Um, occasionally, this, I'm going to go fast on this one, but if you started from sulfonamide, they took sulfonamide, and, which is an antibiotic, um, and they tweaked it and they turned it from being sulfonamide to being a tall butamide. So they replaced an amine group with a methyl group. And all of a sudden, it, has a, it affects your blood sugar levels in, instead of a, being an antibiotic. Totally different. All right, so it's not always things that are related to each other even. Sometimes you just get totally different effects. And so it is still, in a lot of ways, still guess and check because we don't understand the ner nervous system well enough. Um, so this will be the last one that we have a chance to go through probably. I might go a little bit over because there's one more thing I want to talk about. Um, but promethazine was an antihistamine, but they also found it lowered body temperature. Somebody else um, realized, a French psychiatrist realized that the traditional method for calming psychotic patients was to wrap them in cold, wet towels because dropping their body temperature slowed down the manic response and they were able to calm down the body system. So he thought, well, if we can do that by calming them down by um, wrapping them in wet towels to drop their body temperature. What if we drop their body temperature by using promethazine instead. And he found that he used, when he used promethazine, and this is probably not done in a, um, in a, what we would consider to be an ethical way these days. He's basically experimenting on psych ward patients in the, in the uh, 50s or 40s. Um, and he, but he did find that when he administered promethazine to his patients, it suppressed psychotic symptoms. So the first antipsychotic drug was originally an antihistamine that had the side effect of blowing body temperature, which led to this, this psychiatrist thinking, hey, this might work. And it wasn't probably that unethical because he's using a drug that was well understood as lowering body temperatures. It wasn't like some random compound he found in a lab and just decided to inject these, his patients with it. But it probably was not with the traditional double blind study that we usually think as being uh, the best way to do drug trials. Um, and so then they started from promethazine and they wound up with Thorazine, which is still in use as one of the most com um, powerful antipsychotics um, and led to tricyclics, 
these tricyclic antipsychotic drugs then led to a first generation of antidepressants, which they still refer to as tricyclic, tricyclic uh, compounds. Um, and basically what, this, what these antipsychotics do is they basically, um, they deactivate the dopamine and adrenaline systems and they up the acetylcholine and GABA concentrations in a way that makes it so that you wind up um, not, not being as manic. It's very similar to some of those benzodiazepines where you're upping the calming, um, calming uh, compounds and you're slowing down the, the efficiency of these others. The downside to this, and this is true why, why a lot of people on antipsychotic medication um, go off of their meds is because if it's depressing how effective your dopamine receptors are and lowering your dopamine levels, it doesn't feel good. Dopamine is basically what's responsible for your feeling of enjoying anything is a result of dopamine levels in your brain. And so if antipsychotics are basically interfering with the dopamine levels in your brain, then it feels like you don't enjoy anything anymore. You don't get any pleasure out of anything anymore. You don't have any sex drive. You don't have any desire to go do hobbies. You don't do anything. So there's a fine line between keeping, between using the antipsychotics so that, so that you can function without being too, um, without being schizophrenic or without being um, too manic or too depressed and still allowing enough of the natural interactions of dopamine and serotonin in a way that you can still, you know, enjoy your life, have a good quality of life. Um, because it's to the average person who's not on antipsychotics or anti-bipolar um, medication, it seems like, well, why would you ever go off your medication? Well, because a lot of times the medication can remove a lot of the things that you actually enjoy doing um, in a healthy way. And um, it's an older movie, but I highly recommend um, Garden State. Um, is a pretty good movie from the early 2000s with Zach Braff in it um, that does a pretty good job explaining. He doesn't really explain, so it took me a long time from when I, I saw it initially when I was 18. Um, it took me a long time to fully understand what they were showing, but basically it was, it was a guy who goes off his meds and all of a sudden enjoys life a lot more, and um, they do a pretty good job of... Um, of showing what that would look like to somebody who has been medicated for psychiatric disorders for a long time, I think. Um, I'm sure there are inconsistencies and things that they do poorly as well, but. All right, here's the last thing I wanna talk about. Um, and that is penicillin and antibiotics. And mainly um, because penicillin was the first antibiotics I'm sure most of you have heard. And it works by, it inhibits the enzyme that that makes bacterial cell walls. And so basically you can't make bacterial cell membranes without this particular enzyme that penicillin basically breaks. You actually form penicillin forms a covalent bond with this activated enzyme and basically shuts it down. You make this, this version of the enzyme that's totally inactive. And it's a covalent bond, so it's more or less irreversible. So it's not like, this is a, that classic example I was talking about before, where you don't want your binding affinity to be too hard or too high, or you completely shut down that enzyme. Well, in the case of antibiotics, we're okay with that, as long as it's only doing it to the bacterial enzymes. So it completely breaks and denatures that enzyme, and all of a sudden, your bacteria can't, can't uh, reproduce anymore. Um, however, it did not take long um, of, did not take very many years of penicillin being overprescribed for everything. The bacteria started developing a, their own enzyme called penicillinase that takes penicillin and it breaks it before penicillin can break the cell, cell membrane enzyme. So penicillinase is an enzyme that takes penicillin, breaks apart this four sided ring structure, which is what makes penicillin active. Um, and then releases it as this penicilloic acid, which is no longer is no longer an antibiotic. And then the penicillinase is back and goes continues on its way. Um, so 
well, this was a problem because we like penicillin and being able to, to stop bacterial infections. Um, and so now when they administer penicillinase or penicillin, they typically do it with a drug called a sulfone because sulfone, um, sulfone allows, basically gets in the way of penicillinase. We basically have a, a um, escalation going on where, you know, doctors prescribe penicillin, bacteria develop penicillinase, it's an arms race. And so then doctors um, prescribe penicillin with a sulfone, which breaks penicillinase. And then so then I'm sure the next thing that will happen is that bacteria will develop a resistance to the sulfone. Um, and so, but, but by administering these two drugs together, the sulfone breaks down the penicillinase, which leaves the penicillin free to break down that cell membrane enzyme. So by putting them together, you wind up with an effect that is better than either of them separate, which they refer to as drug synergy. Um, and this is actually one of the, I hate the word synergy normally. I looked to see if there was another word to describe it, but this is actually one of the few cases where it's appropriate to use the word synergy. Um, synergy just means that when you, that the sum is greater than the parts. When you put these two drugs together, they work in a way that is, that is stronger than either of the drugs separately. Which is also the way that you know managers use it when they talk about synergy in a company and things like that. Um, but in this case, it actually is the technical term when you have these drug interactions that compound the effect of both of the drugs simultaneously. Um, and so you can wind up with that happening unintentionally in some cases. For instance, if you have acetaminophen in your system and you also drink alcohol, you can wind up with a drug synergy that winds up destroying your liver very fast, faster than either Tylenol or alcohol on its own. Um, and so, and that's also what happens if you do something like take alcohol with, um, with an opiate. They, you know, if you mix opiates, which depress the, the central nervous system and slow down all your unconscious nervous system, with alcohol, which does the same thing, but in a different way, the, the two effects wind up interacting with each other to be worse than either of them on their own, right? So the idea that the drugs can work together um, to, to compound the effects is drug synergy, and it can be positive or negative. Um, and that's why you have to be very careful about mixing any medications even things that seem like they're totally different things, you have to be careful about mixing them because there might be some interaction at some um, unconscious nervous system um, part of the body that where they are acting on a similar part of the brain. You can also wind up with the opposite happening where they effectively cancel each other out. If you, if you drink alcohol with an antibiotic, with the wrong antibiotic, though they basically cancel each other out. Um, and you wind up with that antibiotic being useless because the ethanol, um, having the ethanol in your system at the same time effectively renders that, that antibiotic worthless. Um, so you always be careful, even with things you don't think of as being medications, even over the counter stuff, even alcohol, if you're taking medication, be very careful about any, any interactions. And that's why I wanted to get to um, before. And so why I went over a little bit. So I apologize for going over. Um, I do have office hours at 1030. If anybody needs any last minute help with your presentations, um, we're, we'll start the presentations at, at one. Um, and remember, you might not be starting at exactly the time slot you signed up for. Um, you know, if, uh, if nobody signs up for, for that first time slot, whoever's the first person in the in the queue is going to be going at, at one or close to it. Um, so um, you can, if you wanted to practice doing your screen share or something in my office hours, that's fine. Otherwise, I can run your slides if your computer, if your internet connection won't let you talk and show slides at the same time. Um, just let me know and I can run your slides. Um, we can iron out all those kinks when we get ready to present at one o'clock. And then that's the your biggest. You have that, and then you have your test, and then you're done with this class just about. I think I made the practice test with the study guide a homework assignment as well to bump up that grade as well, but you're almost done.
any questions um, relevant before I stop recording. Again, office hours, 1030 to 1130. If you need any help with anything or just want to test out your, your PowerPoint slides, just let me know.